everybody have fun last night? Yeah? Did anybody talk to anybody new last night? Yes. Yeah? Let me see a show. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I learned some really cool stuff yesterday, and it was awesome. Um, today, we've got a couple of keynotes that we're going to go through, um, and then it'll be time for lunch. So it's pretty easy. I think you just get to li listen to some awesome people, say some awesome things, and then we'll be good to go. And I'm here, too, but, you know. Um, so first, I want to introduce uh, Professor Jonathan Jansen uh, from here at Stellenbosch University. Um, he said, he did, I don't need to say a lot about him. Uh, he was recently, he's recently stepped down as the president of the Academy of Science of South Africa. But also, like, every person from this area was like, oh, Professor Jansen is speaking? That's so amazing. So I think we're in for a bit of a treat, and I think uh, he's just under, letting me undersell him a little bit, so I won't let him do it. Uh, please uh, say welcome to Professor Jonathan Jansen. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. As my American friends like to say, welcome to Africa. <laughs> and as my late mother would have said, I'm not from Africa, I'm from Cape Town. Anyway. <laughs> Only the locals will understand <laughs> that joke. Anyway, we can agree we are somewhere near the southern tip of Africa. This was, the whole plan was to sort of push all the whites into the sea, you know, and uh, because you can't go uh, any further. Uh, anyway, you are all very, very welcome. Every morning at about 6.30, I leave home for a 10, 15-minute drive to a dysfunctional school. And when I get to the school, the only people there are the security guards and uh, a, uh, a couple of kids whose parents drop them very early because they come from far away. This is on the Cape Flats. It's about 40 minutes drive from here. And, uh, and I ended up at the school because last year this school had the worst results in the grade 12 exams, which we call the matric or the NSC, the National Scene Certificate. And so I uh, obviously read the news of horror. How does a school in retreat where I grew up get to have the worst results in the country? And uh, that wasn't the reason I went to the school. The reason is that the school is right next to the family home in which I, I grew up. And so I picked up the phone and called the the minister, the head of education in this province, and I said, listen here, I've worked in schools around the world, I've worked in schools in all the nine provinces, it would be wrong of me not to put up my hand and say to you, look, I'm here, uh, let me help you turn around the school, and so on, and you can get it for free. Well, I said, talk to your bosses and get back to me. He says, I'm not talking to my bosses, can you start tomorrow? So I said, yes, if the school agrees. The school agreed, and so I went off to the school early one morning. Again, nobody was there except the guards, and I took a walk around the school plant, and uh, I could not believe what I saw. There's one sort of double-story building, and as you go up along the sides of the building, I saw more condoms than in the Department of Health. So I knew, you know, we got a problem, okay? We found the culprit, and he then said to me, no, uh, the reason they use the condoms, I didn't know this, even though I grew up there, is to polish their shoes. I said to the young men before we expelled him, what a bad use of condoms, you know? Um, no, we didn't expel him, uh, uh, etc. cetera. And, uh, and so for the next uh, 12 hours, I sat at that school, with my head in my hands, because even though I have worked in very dysfunctional schools, i never seen anything like this. Never. So as the kids came through the gates, half of them clearly were stoned, that you could see they couldn't walk in a straight line, you know, they were smoking stuff, they had uh, these little sweets in their mouths, which is, uh, sorry, one way, of course, in which to, uh, you know, to get high. And, and, and as I was talking to some kids, I saw one boy who felt that it was too much of an effort to go to the side of the double story and come down. He would come down the drain pipe. So here's the kid. I'm not making this up. Here's the kid 
and he comes sliding down the Dane Pipe. And I remember saying to myself, well, fuck. <laughs> you know, um, and I couldn't believe it. It's like, no, no, in front of the teachers, you know, etc., uh, etc. Et I then decided, to, uh, you know, this is sort of years of experience working with schools in chain uh, turnaround projects, to sit in the classrooms. So you go to the smallest unit of analysis in, in organizational terms, which is the classroom. And I go into this grade eight classroom. This is the first year of high school, by the way. And I'm, I wish I could add a, 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 my phone with me because the kids, was, the boys, were sitting with their feet on the desk. The teacher's busy there, screeching away. The kids sitting over there. Other kids were coming in and out as they please. And as a former high school teacher in the Western Cape, both rural and urban schools, I mean, you're dead if you try that in my classroom. But they were coming in and out. And I thought, this is weird. Because as a social scientist, I'm trying to understand, you know, how such dysfunctionality happens in the first place. Next thing I see a kid, a girl, shoving the teacher. I thought, shit. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there but not there. I can't go and intervene. Um, and, and this went on for a while. All kinds of kids came in with those headphones, you know. They were listening to their music. The teacher was teaching a subject, ironically, called life orientation. And, and I remember feeling traumatized. So when all of this was done, I went to the principal's office. I said, ma'am, you have a dysfunctional school. She looked at me. And you could see she uh, rocked back her head. How can you say I have a dysfunctional school? I said, no, you have a dysfunctional school. Um, I said, when last have you been out of your office? She said, yeah, I don't normally. I said, walk with me. So I walked with her. And of course, I showed her what was going on in the school. Anyway, that night I went home, and, you know, I don't cry easily, um, but I remember getting up at 4 o'clock that morning and just being devastated. And the reason I was devastated was because I couldn't believe 30 years after democracy in South Africa, 80% of our schools, of the 25,000 schools in our country, actually in varying degrees, are as dysfunctional as the school. 80%. 20% of the schools are okay. All right? And I couldn't believe that we could fail our children in such a way that nobody took notice. But again, my social scientist kept. The next morning, I went back to that class that I was in, and this time, <laughs> it got worse. So I sat at the back of the classroom to sort of take in the kids, the teacher screeching in the corner, and 15 minutes into the class, a girl comes in, uh, probably 15 years old, and um, earplugs, um, and she had a tracksuit top, the school's tracksuit top, incidentally, over her head. Those of you who are from the United States, I know your school's a little bit there, don't try this there, it won't work. Yeah, you can. So I said to my girl, come here. While the teacher's teaching there, or screeching, and she came. And I said, take that bloody thing off your head, man. So she took the track to the top off her head. What she then did, I will never forget for as long as I live. 15-year-old kid. She comes to me as if I'm sort of just landed there from Mars or someplace. And she comes right into my face. And because uh, you guys are very sensitive about people coming too close to you, so I'll have to do it with this, uh, this thing over here. <laughs> Americans are screwed, eh? I, mean, I tell you. <laughs> where, do you, where on earth did you hear that you ban history? Anybody here from the state of Florida? Are you before? <laughs> <laughs> and the kid comes to me, and she puts up, just imagine this is a face. And she puts her nose against my nose like this. Now, my son is a psychologist, and he always says to me, Dad, when you're in a difficult situation, de-escalate. <laughs> so as she comes, faces in my, what is the name? I'm, I'm, I'm you know, saying, de-escalate. <laughs> then she steps back. 50-year-old kid. I could blow her over. <laughs> and she takes her index finger and rubs my chin. I said, de-escalate. 
And then she does what only a Cape Flats mother can do. She takes her two arms, puts it in this, puts it to the side of her body like this, looks at me and she says this to me, and why are we so unhappy today? <laughs> They had to pick me up from the floor. I was laughing so much. I mean, I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't believe. I said to her afterwards, "You know, I teach huge rugby boys here at Stellenbosch University. They wouldn't even dare to come this close." You know. Anyway, then I realized, of course, the school is fucked up, right? <laughs> so what do I do now? So I said to the principal, "We've got two things to do here. The one is we've got to get the academic scores up from 35.9 percent average." to about 70% within 10 months. I said, I can help you do that. And we will get there in December, I promise you. But I said, we've got a longer term problem. And that problem is how to change the culture of the school. Because any idiot can hike up the exam results, but it takes a long time to change the culture of the school. And I said, in order for us to change that, I want you to give me a class to teach. So she gave me a class to teach, 9A2, which is A stands for Afrikaans, so I had to quickly learn how to translate uh, carbohydrates into kohlydrata and stuck stuff into hydrogen. I mean, those things are difficult to translate if you're not a natural Afrikaans speaker. Anyway, the class is, of course, chaotic. And uh, I then did, which will not work in many of your countries, it works here, I basically said to kid, would you fuckers please sit down? <laughs> they got such a shock, they sat down. Okay. And then I started to teach them probably the most boring part of the natural science syllabus, which is physical chemistry, and even more boring is the periodic table. You want to put somebody to sleep, teach the periodic table, <laughs> all right? So I had them for a double period teaching the periodic table. And then something amazing happened. As I was about to leave, two of the boys stood up and said, would you please not send us back to our regular classes? For the first time, we understand these chemical elements. Now, of course, there's a way of teaching, but the most important thing that I learned in that moment is the importance of connection. They will not respect you. They will not listen to you they will not do great work for you unless you respect them deeply. So I came into the class the next day, and, I, and there was chaos as usual, because you know they take about 10 minutes just to calm down. And I said to them, we're gonna do something different before I continue with, the, uh, with uh, calcium and iodine and all of these interesting stuff. I want each of you just to take a minute and tell me something that you're grateful for. Now, they have a lot not to be grateful for. They can't be grateful for the fact that their father is in Palsmo prison. They can't be grateful for the fact, I know this because I interviewed all of them, because their mother who did two days ago. They cannot be grateful for the fact that they don't even have parents who show up for teachers' meetings. Uh, they normally come by themselves or with an aunt or an uncle uh, who is drunk. There's not much to be grateful for, but I said, tell me something that to be grateful for, and I'm going to start. So I started. And I said, I thank God every day that I have the opportunity to teach you because you have taught me how to be more fully human. And I looked around, and suddenly four people stood up, all boys, which is like very unusual in South Africa. I thought the girls would stand up. And the one boy says, I want to thank you. I'm grateful for the fact that for the first time I understand science. Another kid gets up and says, I'm grateful to be alive this morning because where I live in Lavendale, there is no gas. By the way, in South Africa, don't let the name confuse you. There's no lavender in Lavendale, right? <laughs> it's our way of being cynical. <laughs> and this kid says, we get killed by stray bullets. I'm grateful just to be alive. And so they went around the class, and they sat down. I looked at their marks after just one semester, one quarter, sorry, term of teaching. And of course, it was very, very good. And the reason it was good was not because I'm a great science teacher. The reason it was good is that we connected with the kids. 
Why am I telling you this story? For a very simple reason. Many of you and I had the privilege of studying in Palo Alto and sort of meeting a lot of people like you guys who wear brightly colored, uh, you know, shoes. <laughs> and you sort of know this is a techie, you know. Um, <laughs> I just look at your shoes. Uh, these, these are Silicon Valley types, you know. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I'm telling you this story because there's a lot of tech evangelism in all of you. This notion that we can just come in and light up Africa and give access through digital education and voila, we transform the continent. Please take a cold shower. <laughs> this is not going to happen. And we'll tell you why it's not going to happen. Because those same kids to whom I teach physical chemistry, using my own pocket, most teachers can't afford that, to go to places and to get them, you know, experimental uh, sets and so on and so forth, uh, get them to do it basic titration, get them to sort of do a basic acid test, you know. You can't do that in our schools. In fact, the kids in the cat classroom, any South Africans here, you know what the cat classroom is? What is cat man? It's computer applications technology. You're supposed to learn how to use computers to solve real world problems. It's actually a school subject. At the school where I teach, there are sort of outdated computers on which they have to put their face into the thing to sort of start their cat classroom. They have no devices to take home to continue learning, et cetera, et cetera. And so what is this rubbish that digital education is going to come to Africa and transform it? It's not going to happen, okay? It's not going to happen. So we have to think deeply about how we might do this. So I did a report for Vodacom uh, uh, that uh, I shared with Ed looking at the state of digital education across the continent and where it was happening. Now, obviously, being Vodacom, they wanted us to highlight uh, their, <laughs> their particular interventions and so on. And so I'm just going to take you a little uh, back a little bit so that you understand the South African situation, which I believe also explains much of what happened in, Africa, in uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, and further north. In South Africa in particular, there were two disruptive events that brought digital to the forefront of our attention. The one was protest, and the other was the pandemic. So when protests happened in the more elite universities, as, uh, one of those is the University of Cape Town, of course, Stellenbosch. University of Cape Town is very excited this morning because they were in one of these rankings that came out as one of the top 100 universities in the world. If you believe that, your marriage is in trouble, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's just bullshit, you know, you can't just sort of jump by 20 and 30 and 40 uh, points, it's just a load of rubbish. Um, but nevertheless, they were very happy. So when the protests happened there around the mid-2000s, it was called the roads must fall. It, was, it had to do with transforming this very colonial university into something that was a bit more inclusive and so on. They had a problem because the protests there got very violent. So what did they do? They shifted the entire teaching platform to online. Send the kids home and say, oh, isn't that a wonderful way in which to stop a protest? I said, you should tell Columbia University. They can learn from how to shut down a protest, you know, the buggers. Um, so the protests immediately were canceled out because there's nobody on campus. And you could now learn your biochemistry or your sociology, etc. protest. Now, I'll tell you what the difficulty with that is in a minute. The other was, of course, the pandemic, because you couldn't put large numbers of people in a room. And so once again, you have, uh, and anyone you want to read, probably the best research on this, it's by a friend of mine called Laura Sinovich, CZ. Uh, I'll send it to Ed at the University of Cape Town. Uh, in fact, they've just put out a book on this stuff, etc. cetera. Here's the problem with inequalities. They were always there, right? But what the pandemic did is to make it very visible, very, very visible. And you have to look at it today. I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to have a look at this and tell me whether you still have as much faith as you might have in the power of technology to do this. So it made the inequality. So let me just give you a very quick two-minute survey of South Africa. So in South Africa, we have 25,000 schools, as I said earlier. 80% of them are totally dysfunctional, uh, and 20% of them work. 
So what are the, who are the 20% of schools that work? It's the former white schools mainly, not exclusively, mainly. And in many of those schools, so one of the schools I work with here in town, uh, St. Cyprian's, it's a girls' school. When you go there, they make the wealthiest school in your country look like a third world country. So you go to that school. This is in Africa, by the way. You go to St. Sips, and then the next day travel to uh, Castalea High School for Girls in Palo Alto, where Steve Jobs sent his daughter, and you come and tell me uh, about inequality. I mean, they got the biggest, the biggest uh, swimming pool, ultra marathon. I mean, you just take your choice. They've got it. Okay? I walk in there and I sort of say, where the fuck did you land today? <laughs> Okay, and then they ask me to speak on inequalities. I'd say I'm being embarrassed, you know. I tell him to speak about soccer or something, you know. Anyway, um, at the same time, within three kilometers from there, I can take you to a school where a kid drowned in his own shit in a pit littering toilet. How is that conscionable? How is that something we accept as normal that you can have in the same country, in the same province, in the same city, in the same district? Such terrible inequalities. But South Africans have gotten used to that. I wrote about this this morning. I'm quite sure I'm going to have to go into hiding because we've put together a cabinet, and I ex explained this morning that that's like putting together a sausage. The less you know about what goes into that government of national unity, sausage wrapped in intestinal tissue uh, that looks like a condom, uh, uh, the less you know about that, the, the, the better, right? But like in most of your countries, the politicians actually don't care a damn about the children of the poor. What they care about is the schools to which their children go. So we did a study of 25 primary schools, elementary schools, uh, along a main road that runs from the city of Cape Town all the way to Fishuk, a uh, scenic little town in the beach. And what we discovered was that there was a pact that formed, a pact that formed between uh, white South Africans and black middle-class South Africans, like me. And the pact went something like this after democracy in 1994, after apartheid. The pact was, we would allow some of you black people into these elite schools, provided you shut up for your t the rest of the time that you year. Okay? And so that's exactly what happened. So all these parliamentarians, all these black parliamentarians, have their children in these 20% of highly functional schools with, with Google Classroom and every digital device you can imagine. And the quid pro quo is, we'll take in a few, not too many. Because you know, white people in both America, there's only two countries I know well besides Zimbabwe, white Americans in particular, like white South Africans, the moment there's too many black faces, they flee. Okay, they take off. Best research on this is by the Harvard Civil Rights Project and more recently by the UCLA Civil Rights Project, an extension of that. So if you want data, go look at that, okay? Year two, so you don't want to frighten the white South African families. You basically make sure there's about 20, maybe 30% black middle class kids. That's about. Now, here's the nice thing about these social pacts. Nobody wrote it down. There's no contract. There's no... <laughs> There's no evidence of this, right? But because we studied these schools quite intensely, we could see the point at which white schools became black. Obviously, no black schools became white, except for one in Durban, but that's another story I'll have to talk to you about some other time, uh, etc. So in these 80% of schools, the inequalities were so amazing, but they showed up in at least three different ways. I'll come to universities later. So if you went to St. Cyprian's, or you went to Westerford, or you went to Bloomhoff over here across the road, or you went to uh, Polaris, you would see those schools. Now, the reason they could transition without sort of a, you know, anything in between to fully online, so there was no emergency uh, 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 online programs. They went straight to online. It's be even before the pandemic, they were already equipped with the technology, with the training, with the devices to be able to
transition. So it was nothing new to them when our president said, uh, you know, in 2021, uh, we're shutting down the schools. They just continued as if nothing happened. The same for the elite universities. Not all our universities are the same either, right? And so that group of schools had no problem. In fact, it was a lot of fun. By the way, the kids obviously missed, most of the children missed going to a regular school. Uh, what do you think, Ed? Uh, Sorry, my classes are interactive, so I'm coming to you. Could it be interacting with their peers? Interacting with their peers. They miss their friends, but guess whom they also miss? I mean, this is crazy. Teacher. They miss their teachers. Are you nuts? Yes. <laughs> they miss their teachers. And they would say, and so we did a study of 400 kids and sort of say, you know, what did you miss most? And they missed their teachers. This is bizarre, right? You're trying to get away from them in a normal year. Now you actually miss them. But there was no problem. Oh, by the way, do you know the only kids who liked not going to school? I got good data on this. Whom do you think, ma'am, were the kids who delighted in staying at home? All the introverts. <laughs> Maybe, sir. Um, I have not a clue. The kids who were bullied. So the kids who were bullied say, thank God. I don't have to go through the stress every single day, you know, of being bullied because of this. Then there was this middle group. This is where the kids, the teachers would arrange for the kids to receive material that they could download directly onto WhatsApp. Here's the problem, of course. That's not sort of pedagogically rich materials. That's just pages and pages from a textbook, which you don't have in your regular school anyway, and so on. But there's a problem with that. I'll come to that in a minute. And then there were those who depended on radio and television. And I should have had a fourth group. And those are kids in the very rural schools who had nothing. So you see, it's not just that the system is unequal. It's unequal in different ways, depending on which school you found yourself in. So across the road from where you are now, you're welcome to come and have a look in. I try in the way I do my work as an educator and as an activist to bring our children together for all kinds of reasons. Um, and so across the road, I have grade 10 kids from six different schools, and I deliberately chose the wealthiest schools in this province and the poorest schools in the province and everybody in so that they can all learn about slave history in 3D. So that's what they're doing right now. But you see, I can't just teach them about slave history, the facts. I've got to teach them about how to be as human beings, how to live together, how to learn together, and if you're lucky, how to love together. That group in the middle has other problems. This group obviously uh, struggled as well because of other problems with provision from government. Now, what did these other two groups, particularly the one in the, oh, I'm so sorry, the group in the middle really struggle with? One is if you did have a cell phone, a mobile phone, or a laptop, it, was, it belonged to your parent. And your parent would give it to you late at night after they had done their own work, etc. So the device is shared, uh, 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 etc. Secondly, the data is very expensive. So you had to make, I wrote an article, you can, it's freely available online, it's called Data or Bread. And what you had was kids having to decide, am I going to eat or am I going to have data with which to work? And then, of course, the connectivity is very, very unstable in South Africa generally, but especially in poorer communities. So let's zoom out, and then I'll zoom back into the South African situation as this sort of uh, reality check that we need to do. Remember in Africa, 97.5 million kids don't attend school, 86%. Uh, the learning poverty rate, by the way, is the number of kids, okay, who can't, at, by the age of 10, understand, read and understand a basic text at the grade level. 86% of kids across the continent can't do that. 
And that's more or less just slightly higher for South Africa at the grade four level. Okay, we've got good data on that. And there are completion rates in upper secondary uh, are very low as well. So what I suggested to, in the report I did for Vodacom, uh, is there's, there's a few ways we can start to try and resolve this uh, dilemma. The one is uh, by changing the laws and the policies that makes it, make it very difficult to have digital education at scale. That's the first thing you could do. Okay. The second is to look at partnerships. There is no way government can do this by itself, especially in the South African case, a corrupt government. In South Africa, by the way, if you're in government and you don't steal, they think you're the problem. <laughs> okay, that's the new norm. Okay, that's the new norm. Everybody steals. Uh, uh, and so on. In the province where I worked before I came here, uh, the head of finance, who happened to be a member of the ruling party, said, yeah, every tender is, is, every tender is loaded by an extra 10% for corruption. You know, you build it into the system. Okay, it's part of your counting uh, uh, mechanisms and so on. So you've got to do this with the private sector. You've got to do this with tech companies. You've got to do this with NGOs. You've got to do this with all partners in order to deliver. And the country that gets this right, even though its GDP is much lower than South Africa, is Kenya. You go to Kenya and you see a very strong governmental leadership, very strong private sector involvement, and much better learning outcomes simply because of this notion of partners. Sec thirdly, you've got to do training. We lost about 10% of our teachers in this province alone when the pandemic hit because there were older teachers who generally said, this technology is not for me. I'm two years from retirement. I'm going home, okay? So obviously training has to be part and parcel of, of this uh, solution. Then of course, you guys know more than I could possibly do about all of the infrastructure you need to be able to do this. Mindset is important, obviously affordability, and then this thing called leadership. Now, <coughs> the problem with leadership is that it has to be credible. It's got to be capable, but it's also got to be credible. It's got to be able to step into a situation such as this. So when the pandemic hit, I said to my friends, including former students who worked in the national government, I said, tell the president to put this ambitious project under his direct, you know, uh, influence. You've got to drive this from the center. Otherwise, it's not going to happen in a country with, uh, with our kind of uh, uh, politics. But you're going to need leadership up and down the system for this to happen. So I want to suggest the following. First of all, in African countries, certainly in South Africa, um, you can't go digital unless you also deal Underline the word also, I'm not saying one or the other, unless you also deal with some of the basics. If kids are drowning in their own shit and you've got the most amazing technology on the other side of the school, just trust me, you've got a, you got a huge problem. You've got a credibility problem, first of all, and, and you've got a very human problem, okay? And I just don't see how you can have a kid sitting with a tablet over a toilet trying to do interesting things. It's just wrong. This is just wrong, okay? I shouldn't be able to make technical arguments. I must be able to make a human argument for this. And I don't think we are there as a country. Number two, you can't do this without governmental leadership at the top. Now, as I said, we just established a government of national unity. It's like putting together a sausage. And in a sausage, the less you know about it, how it was made, the better. You know that expression, right? So in this sausage, you have a lot of shit, OK? You've got people with completely different ideologies in the sausage. For those South Africans, let me just ask you, did you ever think a white right-wing nut from the apartheid era, okay, would be head of correctional services? They, that's where they put us <laughs> not too long ago. But they have, the, and by the way, my favorite one is a chap called Gaten McKenzie. You know, he is now, this, this thug, who has spent time in prison, a lot, 10 years in fact. Um, hi. Uh, he's head of arts and culture. What the fuck does he know about arts and culture? <laughs> you think he's going to enjoy a performance of Swan Lake? <laughs> or understand the rich meaning of the words in uh, Darkum de Alibama, a slave song? 
Okay, so we messed up. You've put all these people together, and eventually, of course, this sausage is going to explode, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. But you need governmental leadership at the top. Here's what happened with this government of national unity. You separated out higher education. It's got its own minister now. Science and technology, it now has its own minister. There used to be one, by the way. And digital is, has its own minister alongside, wait for it, communication. Non-serious. I don't understand this. Okay, Zimbabwe also used to have, by the way, uh, I studied Zimbabwe uh, education for a long time. The, they used to have a division called uh, Sports, Arts, Culture, and Women. I'm not making this up. And as a feminist, of course, I, I objected and they threw me out of the country. But anyway, um, there's no logic to the sausage making machine. But if you want to solve this problem, you clearly have to bring digital into the same conversation with education, into the same conversation with science and tech. Otherwise, you're not going to. Because when ministers actually do their work, they do it in silos. It's just the way politics works. I'm concerned that I do well. I couldn't care a damn about what happens in other, in other territories and so on. So we don't have that kind of leadership in our country. And, uh, and that's a fact. I talked about these structural anomalies. And you have to take a good look at the inequality problem. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a home in which your children were not doing well unless everybody's child was doing well. Unless everybody's child was doing well. And this for me is fundamental to a socially just uh, approach to digital education. I wait to hear from you, and I hope this was mildly more exciting than a Joe Biden speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jensen. All right, we've got some time for questions. Questions. Oh, he's a tough act to follow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what happened to the culture of the school you described at the beginning? Was that turned around? So, uh, as I suggested earlier, changing the results is relatively easy, and we'll get that right by December when we write our finals. Uh, changing the culture of the school, I told the principal, will take about three years. Because unlike results, culture, you can't just switch the lights on and off like that. But we have started doing certain kinds of things, which to you might sound weird if you're from another country, but bear with me as I explain. So. At about 10 minutes to 8 every morning with the principal, I stand at the gate of the school, and 1,200 kids come past us, right? And one of the things I said to the principal, we're going to get to greet everyone. Whether they greet us back or not is another story. We're going to greet. So as the kids come in, I would say with a really you know, cheery voice, and then they come in, and they greet, or professor, or good morning, and so on. Until one day, a girl came past, I'll never forget this. And she came past with a friend. And I said, good morning, ladies. And her friend greeted, but she didn't greet. So they walked past me. And then she says to her friend, just loud enough for me to hear. Sorry, I first have to give you this in Cape Afrikaans, because otherwise I will miss a lot of the. She says to her friend, Ikruti yes, my mani. I don't even greet my parents, my mother. What the hell is wrong with this fat guy? You know, uh, et cetera. Now, for me as a social scientist, this is data. Why? Because I now know, of course, I already suspected this, that she gets up at home in the morning and doesn't even. So those basic kinds of social graces, the basic kinds of etiquette, the kinds of things you just need to, for example, you won't believe this. So when I come into a class and I see a kid, this happened four times, and the kid at nine in the morning, head is on the desk, I guess, and so on, and then I wake them up, and I say, Sarah, what's wrong with you? No, sir. 
I've got uh, to think. Now, in a school like this, okay, there is no social services. There is no medical and dental health. So I take the kids, I took four kids, four different times, to the dentist across the road. I say, I'll pay for them. You just sort them out. So the dentist sorts them out. I take them to the pharmacy for um, uh, painkillers and for antibiotics. And then I take them home. Do you know something interesting? Fascinating. Not a single one of those kids came back to me the next day and said, thank you. No, I don't need the thank you. Just <laughs> That's not the point. The point is it wasn't in their behavior, in their social setting. Just to say the most basic thing, which is thank you. You relieved my pain. None of them came back. Right? So changing the culture of the school means, first of all, just getting simple things right. Now, this might be over the top again for some of your candidates, but here it works. So being able to say to your kids, you're not just going to come into a classroom. You're going to line up there. You're going to take off all, everything gadget that's on your head, every cap, because you're coming into a place of learning. That's a bit contrived, but you know what I'm trying to do here. And so we do that. I literally pick up the dirt myself. And then the kids are around, no, 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 Professor, let us pick it up. I say, no, too late, I'm picking up the... I'm trying to get a culture, and then you work on the issues of teaching and learning, of pedagogy and assessment, the other stuff that you want to get to, but you can't get there in chaos. You get there by establishing some basic rules for engagement. So it's going fairly well at the moment. If you came there now, the kids will tell you. The school is much more organized than it was before. I don't want to leave the impression I did this. I rallied a team of people, who are, of teachers, senior teachers, who are very effective in enabling that. But I also have to be honest with you, sir, it will take a few more months before all those tracks are laid down. But it's nice to see things starting to happen. Yeah. By the way, just so you know, Ed is paying me a lot of money for this talk. <laughs> Every cent of that talk goes into feeding those children at the school, just so you know. Okay? Uh, Jesus is coming. There's no reason for me to use the money on myself. So, I know it's very anti-American, but uh, it's what I like to do. <laughs> so. uh, thank you for the keynote. Um, I'm Regis. Um, I don't come from the U.S. I come from France. From France? Uh, oh, my yeah. God. What did you do to Macron? Exactly. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's another story. About that. No, it's not another story. It's about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, uh, these are two very different countries, the U.S. and France. Um, the common point is that we're both about to enter a pretty fucked up political situation. That is true. That is true. That is true. So, uh, uh, and it's in, in probably in no way comparable to, to South Africa. Um, but still, I, uh, it would be great to have your insights on what can we do in terms of education in a very adversarial uh, context when you're trying to do things and um, uh, leadership is against you and um, that the whole economic, uh, economical uh, situation is, is against you. There are all these inequalities that you cannot fix by yourself, even mm. if you're a powerful organization. Mm. So how do you work in that context? Is it... Is it um, what you're doing, uh, is, is, that, is that what is best, like stepping in as an individual mm. and doing whatever you can, or like... Um. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, thank you for sharing that, uh, and I do worry about, about France, obviously the United States, Hungary, I mean, take your pick of countries around the world right now. We're having this resurgence of a very dangerous populism uh, in which anti-immigrant sentiment carries a lot of people's uh, political behavior. Uh, don't count out the UK. It's also sort of, I think the elections are today, in fact, uh, etc. So, yeah, we, uh, all I can tell you, we've been there for 350 years. And, and it took a long time from slavery through colonialism and then through apartheid. And eventually we won. And just compare January the 6th in the US to what happened here the other day. We had a fairly seamless transition of, of power from a, a shit old country, as Trump called us, you know, uh, to, to a government of national unity. Now, of course, as a public nuisance, I have to, and a columnist, I have to criticize it, you know, um, uh, etc. I don't know of another way in which to do this than to do 
several things at the same time. One is to make sure, forget about scale for the moment, to make sure that where you are, you have an influence. So I have an influence here over 1,200 kids, okay, with my team, of course, at the university. I have an influence over 280 kids, all of whom become teachers, and every single year we graduate 280 of them to do a one-year teacher's diploma, where we talk about these kinds of things. I have an influence through, as a national columnist, I have an influence. In other words, all of us have different, uh, you know, positions within society in which we can influence uh, our countries for the good. The other thing that is really, really important, and I do this with parents all over this country, all over the country, is to remind them that a lot of those values are actually things that you install uh, in the first most powerful socializing institution. And that's not the school. That is actually the home, right? And so on. So where do I tell parents all the time, and I do these workshops every day virtually, is that I can predict with certainty whether your kid is going to become a racist simply by virtue of who comes over to your home on a Friday night for a barbecue. We call it a braai. And predict it, okay? At this university, just the other day, a white kid urinated on the property of the, the black top and clothes of a black student in the same residence at this university. What was that about? It wasn't about now. It's about 120 years of existence of this university in which seeing black people for the first time in a place of residence is a problem. So the struggle is real, and I don't know of another way other than to demonstrate, you know, through both your own life, but also through your actions, ways in which to push back. Um, the, in France, I don't know the, the French national situation as well uh, as I should. Uh, I know for a fact there must be many liberal, radical, alternative organizations sort of saying, what do we do in civil society? What do we do in education? What do we do in public health? What do we do in immigration? Okay? To push back against this right-wing sentiment. Um, again, this comes down to leadership at all these different levels. But our biggest problem in South Africa for 30 years of democracy, we invested so much in governmental leadership, and we forgot all the other ways in which leadership could take us out of this 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 uh, uh, problem that we that we in, and uh, if I may just wax eloquent for a moment, and borrow from Obama, who borrowed from somebody else, he said, "You remember that famous expression? I love it. Uh, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice." And then Barack Obama added, "But this doesn't bend by itself." Hi. Hi. Good morning, Professor morning. Johnson. Um, as a South African, I was very invigorated by your speech to solve this whole inequality problem. Uh, all of our colleagues from around the world here um, are involved in the tech space, most of them. How do you implore them to uh, kind of integrate a more social mission within their daily lives and workspace and invest back into Africa uh, to solve this inequality problem? Yeah. Um, I just missed that one word you said. Did you say uh, tech-based? Was that the term you Technology, okay, cool. So, so listen, you know, I was really glad. Let me, let me just also just commend uh, Ed and the team and so on. I think it's really important for you to not just go to Western Europe and North America with this conference. I'm glad you're here. I hope you go to Asia if you haven't been there yet, uh, and other parts of Latin America, other parts of the world. So it's great to have you guys here because you actually have enormous influence, okay? You have enormous influence. And so... One of the ways to do that is to do that through educational institutions, but also through technology companies. There's any number of them just around here in Stellenbosch, as you know, uh, et cetera. And then to begin to influence the decision makers, right? I don't know what your plans are, but I would, if you want to, I can get you 12, 13, including governmental leaders around the table at some point, and say, let's talk about how you can begin to cross this digital divide using the technology and the expertise that many of you in this room have. Uh, there's a lot of problems in my country, but the one thing I have to say, they do listen when people show up and sort of say, yes, expertise. So your very presence here for me is a very important way of beginning that uh, kind of dialogue. In fact, I'm meeting with some of you this afternoon to talk about, among other things, how we can influence education. And then the other thing, you know, call me missionary in my outlook on this. Um, what if some of you just said, you know, we're going to take the 25 of the poorest schools just around here? 
okay? And we're going to make sure that all of them are connected in some way, right? And then find ways of sustaining that intervention over time. Is, is CISWE does that, by the way, Yen Kai Mandi, uh, and many others and so on. So find ways in which to begin to, you know. And, and uh, as I said, because of your firepower in this room, apart from interventions at the local level, also think of having those consultations. I'm happy to be a, a mediator or intermediary at the level of decision makers, private sector, government, the works. So, mm -hmm. sorry, you And we're gonna do last two questions and then we're gonna move on. Can I just ask you before you speak, sir, anybody here from India? Can you see me after class, please? You beat us horribly in that cricket final, man. I, I'm telling you, it's a sore point. It's a sore point. And that guy, Pant, who went down without any injury just to break the momentum of the... Uh, can we talk later, you know? Uh, <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, my name is Umar, and I'm from Iraq. Hi. I'm a software engineer, and, and I work in EdTech. Yeah. So, and I'd like to visit that school that you've talked about. Is yeah. it school seems like, is, is, is the school running at, at, at this time? The school, uh, or the school's on vacation at the moment, we uh -huh. vacation. We stopped teaching yesterday the extra classes just to make up the, you know, okay. the mess. But on Monday, we start with the teachers, and then on Tuesday, the whole school will be present. If you're still around on Tuesday, I would be delighted to host you. I'm not going to be on Tuesday. I, I'm... I'm happy to just uh, visit a school. I just can't go randomly. Okay, That's can we talk afterwards? And I'll sure. be very yeah. happy. And if anybody wants to join, I, I'll arrange something of that nature. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Professor. Uh, many years ago, I worked with the school turnaround project that was in collaboration with Deloitte. Oh, yes. Um, from dysfunctional to functional. Right. And my question is, for those schools that do eventually become functional, what is the sustainability like then? Ah, that's a great question. So... Um, that's probably the most important question. So it's going to be relatively easy to turn around the school that I'm, I'm working in within, as I said, academically and culturally. Two or three years, we'll be there. The problem is if I step away with my networks, with my watch the name, there's a real danger that the school can revert to the past. So what I have built into this model is... Uh, a set of decisions to prevent that from happening. So for example, every single day, including yesterday, I meet with a core leadership team to teach them the skills of how to lead, manage, and administer the school on a sustainable basis. Without that, if your only focus is the kids, it's a lost cause because kids come and go. And so you have to do this with the core leadership team. Then, by the end of this year, I will have a book uh, based on the school experiences, which will go to every one of the 25,000 schools for free in this country, on how to build a sustainable uh, change culture in a school, recognizing, of course, that the culture and context of each school is different. So, but it's going on. So those are sort of some of the ways in which we, we do this, but unless, listen, no school changes anywhere in the world without a leadership team that understands what they're doing. No school. So thanks for that question. Great question. Right. And I think that's all. We There's have one time. more there, and then so we'll do one last one. If you have one, time, one, one okay. Sorry. <laughs> oh my word! <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, do you, oh okay. Go ahead. Uh, a few years ago, I was a substitute teacher at Barrow High School, and um, one of the students asked me the one day, um, "Ma'am, don't you have a, a talent, something that you're good at?" And I was very confused. And I asked her, what do you mean? She said, Is, don't you have a hobby? Don't you have something else to do? And I asked her, where are we going with this? And so she asked, no, but why are you a teacher? Isn't there something better that you can do with your time? And I, I asked her, but do you want someone here who's here because they don't have a choice? Or do you want someone who's passionate about teaching? And I also think that's, that's another thing that we need to change, you know, people teaching to get the holidays or something like that. You know, the teachers also need to become passionate and understand their role and understand what their connection to a student can, can mean and, and make a difference. Yeah, you know, that's such a true but also sad uh, observation because I've, I've, I've picked that up, obviously. Here's the thing, right? Uh, there is no way, by the way, for, let me speak to the non-South Africans here. When you go to a school of education, a place that teacher, trains teachers, 
anywhere in this country. When you come to the historically white Afrikaans schools, universities in particular like this one, and I did this survey for 20 years every year, and you ask the white Afrikaans kids, why did you decide, it's mainly women by the way, why did you decide to become a teacher? Every single one of them says something like this in Afrikaans. My grade nine English teacher, my grade 11 physics teacher. In other words, they had a teacher who was so passionate so knowledgeable, so involved in their lives that they wanted, in fact, one of them told me, I, for a long time, as a primary elementary school kid, I didn't believe teachers went to the toilet. You know, she, she, <laughs> they did not accumulate waste like the rest of us, you know. They were sort of at this, at this level. When I go to township schools in South Africa, and I say, how many of you in a school assembly, how many of you want to become a teacher? Not a single hand goes up. And then one kid at Mamalodi High School said, I don't want to become a teacher. My teacher said, don't become like me. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the problem, okay? Teaching, as you know, is, is, is also, it's old fashioned. It's also about inspiration. You gotta know your subject, you gotta know your pedagogy, but you also gotta know how to connect with kids and inspire them, despite themselves. Last one at the back. Hello, thank you, you're sorry. I think my colleague at the front asked the question I was going to ask you, which is how, what can a, a room full of these people do? Yeah. And I wanted to just say thank you for, for giving a hopeful response to that because I think hearing um, some of the things you've shared, even though you shared it in such a wonderful, engaging way, so thank you so much. Uh, it can feel quite, maybe, maybe people leave this thinking, what can I do? How can I do anything? You know, it's, it's so hopeless. But I think I'm feeling hopeful after your speech, so thank you. Thank you very much. And if you want to see any other potentially inspiring <laughs> videos and speeches on this, go to my personal website, which is jonathanjansen.org. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Very much. Okay, all right, thank you, Professor Jansen. Um, next up, we have to give you the State of Open edX uh, talk, my colleagues from the Axum Collaborative, uh, Ed Zerikor, VP of Engineering, and Jenna Mikowski, our Senior Product Engineer. Thanks, <coughs> thanks very much. Uh, this is gonna be a very different sort of talk. Um, <laughs> and uh, I learned, here, one second. I learned uh, two very, very important lessons today. Um, one of them is never speak after Jonathan Jansen. <laughs> Big mistake. Uh, the second lesson is that uh, I need to say fuck a lot more when I'm speaking in front of you, because that obviously works. So pro tip, I recommend doing that. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm always excited and invigorated to be with the Open edX community together. Uh, and to be together with you in this amazing place uh, is, is maybe the best conference yet. I don't know. We'll see what, what people think. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking, um, is this working? Not really. There we go. Uh, yeah, start by acknowledging you know, this wonderful university that's hosting us. Thank, to, thank you to Stellenbosch University for having us and hosting us. Um, and then I wanted to talk about some of the sponsors that make this event possible. My organization, Axum Collaborative, um, we are committed to uh, scaling equitable education around the world, uh, and we sponsor the Open edX project, as all of you know, uh, and also to construct education. Uh, the firm, and I want a, a special call out to Meg Knight, who was my partner in crime in organizing much of this event. Uh, couldn't have happened without Construct and without Meg's involvement. Uh, and uh, really, really excited uh, that we've been able to make this happen. Um, contributing sponsors, many of the organizations that have been longtime members of the Open edX ecosystem, Edgenext, Schema Education, Intella, DRC Systems, and Edley. Thank you to all of you. Um, and the friends of Open edX, Owls Neo and Raccoon Gang. Uh, I also wanted to mention Westgrow, um, local organization um, that is focused on developing the ecosystem in Cape Town uh, around technology, educational technology specifically, but also tourism and trade. 
Uh, they've been a fantastic partners, and, and uh, we could not have had this event without West Grove's support. Okay. Um, okay, so as I said, this is going to be a much different talk uh, than the one that you just heard. Um, this is an opportunity for us to check in on the health of the Open edX ecosystem, uh, talk a little bit about what we've done in the last year and where we are going, uh, and have a dialogue with the community uh, about, about the health of our project and, um, and what we hope to accomplish. And I think, you know, I, I'm sitting reflecting on the words of Professor Jansen and thinking about what I'm gonna say when I get up here and like wondering, like, do we feel like we can really make a difference? Um, and I hope his comments near the end uh, made us feel like we can. I mean, I think we all are aware that we, as technologists and the builders of a technology platform, um, we are just one very small part of a solution uh, which needs to be holistic, and uh, there are parts of it that we probably personally can't change. Um, but what we do is still very important, and we've had an impact already on millions of learners around the world. So let's sort of embrace, let's acknowledge the limitations of what technology can do but also acknowledge that the investments in, uh, in technology and the technology that we make freely available is still a powerful, um, powerful impact on the world. Uh, I wanted to start by revisiting or refreshing what we, you know, what the vision of the Open edX project. Our goal as a community is to leverage open source, which is a powerful way of distributing technology, making it free to use, free to change, to democratize education and to power advances in learning. Um, every year at the conference, we you know, do the state where we check in on the health of the project and the platform. And one of the things that I do every year is I request to the community, um, please tell me what's on your mind, how things are going, what you'd like to talk about, what you'd like to hear about. Uh, did that as usual this year, and I got some, some interesting uh, responses to this, uh, this query. Um, and I wanna say, one of the responses was, and you know, this doesn't translate well here, but this was meant incredibly sarcastically, was how's the health of the community, you ask, just peachy, and the writer meant clearly in a really bad way. Things were not going well <laughs> from this person's perspective. And we'll talk a little bit about what their specific concerns were. Um, I wanted to highlight this comment, though, because I think a hallmark of a strong community um, and a strong organization is its ability to face criticism, uh, to try to learn from our mistakes, and to you know, acknowledge where we've made them and move forward from there. So uh, we definitely, you know, as a community, I don't think we've pulled punches with each other, and I think we've always been willing to um, kind of try to learn and move forward together. Uh, another one of the people that responded to my request for, um, for uh, you know, things we should discuss mentioned a particular elephant in the room. I probably have too many elephants in these slides, but um, I couldn't resist using this picture. But the elephant in the room that they wanted me to talk about was, um, to, and they said, to, need, to use financial straits are the elephant in the room, and it would be good to address it. Um, on this one, you know, I want to acknowledge the question, but I want to say, I am not going to address this. <laughs> uh, it's not my position to address it. Uh, I wanted to mention that George Babby, who's a member of the TOC and a longtime uh, contributor to the Open edX project, has already addressed some of these concerns in a blog post on the Open edX website. Um, QR code that will let you link to it. It's easy to find, but if you want to read his comments, I think that they still um, are very reflective of 2U's commitment to the project. And um, I'm not going to ignore this the thrust of this question entirely at, by any means, because I think from the project's perspective, there still is this question, how do we ensure that we are resilient and robust to any member of the community departing the community? That is what we wanna know, that this group and the Open edX project and the Open edX platform are healthy enough uh, that we will survive um, any member or multiple members leaving the community. All right. And, as we go through this, we're, you know, I'm going to focus on the community health and some of the platform kind of architectural priorities for the next year. 
Uh, then I'll hand over to Jenna and she'll talk about some of the specific things we're doing from a product perspective. And then finally, we'll have a community story uh, which will be delivered by Elizabeth Gordon from ASU to tell us about some of the important work that they're doing uh, in Ethiopia. So that's the overall arc of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I wanted to talk about, this is a picture of a redwood forest. As many of you know, we've just released the 16th um, release of the Open edX platform called Redwood. Um, but I wanted to use this as kind of a metaphor for what communities are like. Uh, you know, a forest seems like a single thing, but it isn't. It's living and breathing. It's changing constantly. Um, you know, it survives as a thing through that change because it is resilient to any one particular tree falling over. Um, and in all of you know droughts and changes and fires and everything that happens in a forest. Um, in in our particular case, um, I wanted to acknowledge that that there are some people that have left the community. And I say abiento because I don't think they've left it forever, but they're less active than they have been in, over the course of the last year. And I think it's important to acknowledge that that is something that happens continually in an open source project. And I wanted to mention a couple specific people. Um, first, Monica Diaz, someone who had been a member of the Open edX community for a very long time, started working on the Stanford project, came over and worked for edX, and it's now kind of moved out of the community. Um, Pierre Maillot, um, University of Montreal, is moving away from using Open edX on campus. Uh, Pierre, who was a long-standing member um, of, the, of the project and pivotal in some of our translation efforts, uh, less active, although he still pops up in Slack to tell you what he thinks from time to time. I don't think that's going to change. Um, Ned Batchelder, um, longtime colleague of mine at edX, I think someone that everyone in the community admired. Um, Ned had been working on Open edX since 2012 uh, and has moved away from edX and is doing other things now. Uh, and uh, Sophia and Barbe, who um, was really, really critical to the work that BTR was doing in the early days, and you know, Sofian has other priorities right now, so he hasn't been as active in the Open edX project uh, as any of us would probably like. But this is normal. Um, this is how open source projects work. People pop in, they pop out, uh, they make incredible contributions, uh, they, you know, and then maybe they leave entirely. Um, but the thing about forests is that they're constantly regenerating. Uh, when trees fall over, it makes space for new trees to grow. And um, I decided not to list out some of the new contributors who have joined the project in the course of the last year because I was sure I would miss some important names and I didn't want to take that risk. But I think if you look around this room, you'll see people that have contributed over the course of the last year in incredible ways. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're continuing to add, uh, um, add people who are really making a difference in the project. All right, here's the second of the elephant slides. Um, you know, there's another elephant in this forest, and um, I think actually Felipe talked a little bit about the elephant factor in a talk that he gave before I arrived because of my flight problems, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, and for those of you who don't remember, the elephant factor is a metric created by the chaos project, which is part of the Linux Foundation, to measure the health of open source projects. And what it does is it takes all of the organizations that have contributed to the project, sums up their contributions, figures out what the 50% point in that sum of contributions is, and then it adds up the number of organizations you need to count in order to get to that 50% mark. Um, and in the 90 days just prior to 2U's acquisition of edX, uh, the elephant factor was one point something. It was just a little tiny bit over one. The vast majority of the contributions to, uh, to the Open edX project were coming from work that was either funded by edX or done directly by edX. Um, uh, and then in the last 90 days, the project's elephant factor was three. Um, and I think that that is, you know, I think when Felipe measured it, he said four. I think we're looking at different time scales, but I think the message is the same, that we are making really, really demonstrable progress towards a project that's resilient to any member, to you, Axum, whomever, 
leaving the project. You know, I want it to be the case that if you know Axum were to disappear overnight, that this conference would be happening in 2026 and 2027, and somebody else would be standing up here, and the Open edX project would still be a digital good that was available to the entire world. Now, one way that this could happen would be that simply the number of contributions that are being made to the project have gone down so much that you know, two use decreased their input. Uh, the contributions have gone down so much that it really doesn't, um, you know, we're just not doing as much. Uh, but I don't think that evidence suggests that. Um, this is another metric from the Chaos Project that measures the community structure and the number of contributors who are working on the project. They're bucketed into three groups, regular contributors, core contributors, and casual contributors based on how often they contribute to the project. Um, and you can see that especially over the last call it two years, uh, the structure of the community has increased dramatically. The number of people that are contributing is, is much, much greater, and the number of people that are contributing regularly is stable and higher than it was in the past. Um, I also wanted to talk about the sort of raw number of contributions that are being made to the project. This is a longer time scale, starting in, the, in um, July of 2021. Um, and you can see the red line represents the trend line, the, you know, sort of the, trend, the direction that overall contribution is going, and it's clearly going up. So the reason the elephant factor is three or four, depending on the time that you're looking at, is not that the overall contributions have gone down, it's that we actually have more people contributing and doing so more regularly. Another graph I wanted to look at was, um, the lead time to receiving an open source pull request. One of the problems that we've historically had as a project was that when people contributed code, um, that it took way, way, way too long for it to get merged into one of our upstream repos. That's still a problem, um, but we've made some significant progress, and I want to call out two specific people. Um, she was just there, Michelle Philbrick. <laughs> and Tim Crones from OpenCraft, who have been working as Tim's back there. Thank you. The two, well, you have to applaud again when Michelle comes back. The two of them have been focused on managing the, in, the intake of open source pull requests um, to make sure that they are, um, that they're getting merged as quickly as, reviewed merged as quickly as possible. And I, there's two notable things that I want you to, to see in this graph. One is, uh, the variability in the amount of time that it's taking to review and merge these pull requests has gone down dramatically um, since July of, of uh, 2023. And the overall trend in the days of lead time. Wait, Michelle's back, so we got to clap again. <laughs> so I think all to say, um, you know, this is a place where we knew we had an acute issue uh, we as a community came together and thought about a way we could improve it. We focused a couple people on it and we've actually made a demonstrable change. So I just wanted to, to call that out. Um, and I wanted to return to our friend who was really not happy about the way, the, the, you know, the health of the community. And I think their comments were actually not specifically about the health of the community. They were more about a couple ways in which they had been um, burned by the project's uh, changes over time. And I think that they make some really legitimate points, and I think things that we're aware of, but things that I want to highlight again. Um, one was they noted that there were regressions between releases that broke things that they relied on, um, that there were organization-specific features in the core of the platform, uh, that they had difficulty upgrading. It was way too hard. Um, and that documentation generally was not up to date. Um, you know, I think when I originally read this, like it, you know, there were parts of it that made me a little bit angry, I'm gonna be honest with you. I mean, I think we've talked about our community as a duocracy, and it, you know, I think there are some, I could legitimately say to this person, like, did you submit a documentation pull request? I don't think you did, um, but I think Stepping back, the right thing to do is to acknowledge that these are all issues that we're facing and talk a little bit about what we're doing to try to resolve all of these. Um, and talk a little bit about 
what we see is the platform priorities uh, over the next year. So I think there are two different, two different areas of focus that we, we want to take. One is um, slimming down the platform core. It's really expansive, it's hard to maintain, it costs too much, it's too hard to understand. Um, we need a smaller platform, a slimmer platform. Um, and we also need to improve the extensibility and the pluggability of it. Uh, and we've been working on both of these problems in parallel over the last year, but I think it's a continued area of investment that we need to make. I want to highlight a couple things. Um, one is the deprecation plans and progress. The way we make, one of the ways we make the platform slimmer is we get rid of parts of it that uh, are organization specific or don't create a lot of value for other members of the community. And um, with Fenil Patel's help, we put together a pretty robust plan for what we want to do for Sumac and Teak in terms of removing and making the plan, making the platform slimmer. This chart demonstrates both kind of the inventory of stuff that we want to get rid of, the green, and uh, in the light purple or violet, the stuff that we've actually gotten rid of um, in the last quarter. So we've deprecated 24 separate repositories in the last quarter, so significant progress. Um, and another one of the efforts, also Finial highly involved in this through the maintenance working group, is making predictable, reliable maintenance a thing. So many of you are now involved in the, in the maintenance working group. Um, we still need more maintainers, um, but it's thanks to that group that we have things like the Python 3.12 update, uh, the Mongo upgrade, the Ruby upgrade. Um, that work does not happen by itself. Um, so thank you to Vanille and the rest of the working group, but also please help with maintenance. I'll pause here for a moment so you can scan the QR code. This is a really good way to get involved if you're not already submitting pull requests. Um, you can do that today. Um, all right, and a big theme for the next year is sort of focusing on our architecture. Does anyone, probably somebody from Cape Town knows what this is? How do you, Bossier is chapel, yeah. Uh, my wife is an architect, and so modernist architecture is always, uh, I've got to find a place to put it in, in, in any presentation, but this is a beautiful chapel in Cape Town. Um, and uh, architecture is definitely a place where we know that we need to focus as a project in the next year. Um, and I wanted to tell like, a little bit of a story about kind of the power of ready extensibility. I think as engineers, most, many of us are engineers at least, we understand uh, how powerful extensibility can be. Um, but I wanted to, to run through a couple numbers. Uh, 810 million, and I'm gonna ask you in a second if you know what these are. 43.2%, and more than 60,000. Um, does anybody have a guess what these numbers are referring to? Omar. Well, I will say, oh, let me give a hint. I wish these were open at X numbers. <laughs> no? All right. Um, so this represents the uh, 810 million websites that make up 43.2% of the entire World Wide Web. I can still use that word. And the 60,000 uh, plus plugins that are part of uh, the WordPress ecosystem, yeah. Uh, so when we reflect on how powerful extensive, like a readily accessible, uh, extensible system can be, I think this is the target that we are aiming for. This is what I think, I think open edX can be the WordPress of online education. And I think that's the way we should frame like, what we're focused on. Um, and you know, we are making a lot of investments concurrently in extensibility, and I wanna highlight those. Um, wait, no, this is, well, okay. The first one isn't really extensibility, but I wanted to, did these slides get backwards? Okay. Um, I'll talk about, specifically related to extensibility, the events and, um, the events and filters work, um, clearly a good extensibility story. Uh, we have a focus on investment, on updating, um, 
uh, front end composability and pluggability. So people like Brian Smith, Adolfo, Braden, and others, and David Joy has been focusing on composability of the front ends, so a lot of extensibility there. I think we have a big effort over the course of the next year to focus on making it easier to write plugins, making it easier to use events, making sure that that's plumbed all the way through to our front ends and uh, documented so that it's easy to adopt. Um, but I also wanted to mention, you know, we, we're working on certain things like integrated testing strategies between BTR and uh, the product working group to address things like regressions that our friend complained about previously. Um, you know, I think that when we move more organizational specific code into plugins using events, uh, again, we solve one of the problems that was uh, highlighted by our friend, that there's organizational specific code in the core. Um, you know, we have been investing in restructuring and improving the documentation. Uh, we still have lots of room for improvement there. Um, but again, we would really, really enjoy having more contributors to the docs. Okay, so we talked about a little bit about regressions between releases, organization specifics in the core, difficulty upgrading, and documentation being up to date. I think we have some efforts that are focused on all of those things, and I don't want to say that this is a comprehensive list of our problems, but um, you know, uh, let's, I think we're, we're, we're doing a lot of the right things. And also, um, community town hall would be a great time to talk about additional things we can and should be doing to, uh, to improve as a project. All right, so with that, I wanted to hand over to Jenna to talk about some of the specific stuff that we're doing it and tying it back to our architectural initiatives. Well, thank you, Ed. And thanks for being the buffer speaker between me and Professor Jansen. Hopefully by now you've all like forgotten about that talk and we can just move forward. Okay, so I am Jenna Mikowski. I am the senior product manager for the Open edX platform at Axum Collaborative. To give you a little bit of an insight into what the product organization across the community does, we are focused on things like building and managing and prioritizing the community roadmap. Uh, we manage the product proposal review process through the product working group. So anytime there are new contributions coming in that um, touch the end user in any way, we're, we're, we review those pr uh, proposals. Um, so, as Ed was mentioning, a lot of our focus over the next year is going to be on extensibility, making it easier to extend the platform. Um, and, and a couple of projects that Ed mentioned tended to be a little bit more on the back end, right? On the, the more technical or the architectural design of the, of the product on the back end. I want to take a bit of a complementary view to that and explore the question of what does extensibility mean from a product perspective? <laughs> Right, how can we as the product managers and the product teams in the open edX community be thinking about extensibility in our product design and in our product requirements so that we can have this line of continuity not just on the back end and the architecture but on um, in the front end as well and in the features and capabilities that we're designing for users. And so um, asking questions like how does extensibility inform product specs or product requirements, for example. So when we talk about a product lens, um, what we really mean is, what's the impact on the end users, right? Product managers, our number one focus is on understanding who is using the platform, how are they using it, why are they using it, what are their pain points, and then what can we do to mitigate those pain points? How can we design the product in ways that um, mitigate those pain points? And so, when I hear the word extensibility from kind of a, a product or an end user perspective, what I really hear is the word flexibility. How can we be more flexible in how we're designing um, certain features and certain capabilities on the platform? Flexibility actually means customization potential. Now, I think everybody here in this room would agree that customization is one of the strengths of the OpenEdX platform. It's highly customizable, especially when compared to Moodle or Canvas or others. Um, but it's kind of a double-edged sword, right, because it's not easy to customize. It's actually quite difficult to customize. So you can do a lot with it, but it's not easy. And so from my perspective, from a product point of view, or even like a UX, UI point of view, we've gotta be thinking about customization from the end user's perspective as well. How can we make it easier to configure the, the project? How we can make it easier to configure at the feature level, at the capability level? Um, but there's kind of a bigger picture here, right? The more easily customizable the platform is, 
the more effective instructional design there can be. And at the end of the day, that's a better experience for learners. And I think that's why we're all here today. That's our shared mission, right, is to reach as many learners as effectively as possible. So when we're designing new features and capabilities, um, we've been starting to ask questions, like how can we develop this feature in a way that is flexible, that optimizes for customization, and how do we actually write that into the specs or the requirements for the feature so that we can design this kind of from the ground up, from the get-go? Um, so we, before we get into like the how of all of this, I want to just take a step back for a minute and, and answer the why. Like, why is this important for us as a platform? Why is this important for the learners at the end of the day? Um, this is just a quick snapshot. Um, there's like a million different ways to slice and dice the data of the open ethics landscape. Um, Juan gave a really great presentation earlier this week that does a deeper dive into the numbers, like the open ethics landscape. This is a sample of uh, 1,000 instances that are, that are using open ethics across the globe, total random sample. Um, and we're just curious, what are the different sectors that are using the platform, right? So, and you can see many examples here. We've got government, IGOs, NGOs, private institutions, corporate institutions, higher education. Um, and even within that, there's a lot of nuance and differentiation, right? Within higher ed, we've got organizations that are starting to customize open edX for on-campus residential learning, which is moving very f much away from the original MOOC use cases. Um, but we'll hear about Ishii a little bit later today, which is a prime example of that. Um, within the higher ed space too, there's also a move toward kind of the lifelong learning space and the more micro learning interests. Um, so there's a lot of differentiation even within these sectors. Um, but the big takeaway here is that we don't have a singular learner that we're trying to personify or like build a demographic prof uh, profile of. We've got a, a 200 people in this room. Um, if I were to ask each of you, who is, who is your learner, who you're trying to reach, we'd get 200 different answers. And that's, that's one of the strengths of the platform, but we have to design with that in mind, right? So how do we, again, make this as customizable and flexible as possible? So I want to talk a little bit about um, this core platform framework. Um, this is a framework that we've been kind of um, iterating on with the product working group, and it's a framework that we're using now to think about like, when we design a new feature, we think about building a new feature, how do we, how do we think about it with, with this idea of customization? And so at the core of the framework is a set of what we're calling core capabilities. So these are all of the features and capabilities that you would expect to get in an out-of-the-box batteries included installation of open edX. So in other words, these are the, teach, uh, the tools that a teacher needs to teach and that a learner needs to learn. And we've been, we've been doing quite a bit of like, kind of taking a, like a curatorial approach to this, looking at all the stuff that's currently in the core and assessing it against this framework. We've got a rubric. You're welcome to look at the QR code. There's a bunch of documentation about this. Um, but the idea is to get to like a slimmed down list of features that we know we need to support in the core. Another way to think about this is like a reference implementation. So you get the out-of-the-box installation, you're gonna get these features supported. It's also where we're actively maintaining, where we're actively investing. Um, not all of these features are kind of battery operated yet, but we're, we're gonna invest to get there. Um, then in the layer around the core capabilities is what we're calling the pluggable sphere. So this is what, an example of what meant, uh, Ed mentioned earlier with this idea of like MFP plug-in slots. Right, how can we make that more of a seamless integration where you can um, maybe say there's like a, a feature in the core that you don't want to use. It doesn't meet your learner needs. And so how can we have a supported endpoint for you to swap in a feature that you build yourself or like a third party LTI tool that you want to add? And then the last sphere is the <laughs> American, American framework here, a DIY or do it yourself sphere. Right, so we are an open source project. Um, there's always the opportunity to take, take the code and do it yourself, or if you want to extend the project in a way that's not supported, but you're going to support yourself, you can do that as well. Um, but the idea here is that we have to balance all of this in our product design. We think it's important to have a set of out-of-the-box features, but it's also important that we maintain this extensibility space and make it much easier to do, do that extensibility. Um, to build in that space. And again, this is starting to inform how we're thinking about product specs and product requirements. So I want to give a couple examples of what this looks like in practice. So um, has anybody recognized this feature yet? Yeah. Um, this, is a, this is like a crowd favorite, a fan favorite. Um, this is the new learner sidebar experience. Um, I say new. It's kind of old new. 
Um, we used to have this learner navigation experience in Open edX. Um, this is, uh, so this feature, the, the value proposition is that learners are able to have more flexibility in how they navigate the course. They can choose to navigate sequentially or they can choose to navigate non-sequentially. Um, and they don't have to navigate away from the course content to do that. This navigation stays with them the, the entire time. Um, so as we, were, as we were designing, like building the product specs for this, we had, I think, eight or nine different organizations actually involved in the working group to get this project off the ground, which was amazing. It's a great example of how we want to do community-driven development. Um, we were asking the question, like, should this be built in the core? Is this better built as an extension point or a plugin? Or do we not want to support this at all? And the answer that we landed on after looking at like, a, a lot of different reasons, after looking at some competitive landscape research, how do, you know, how do other LMSs do it, after getting a bunch of data from end users and getting their perspective, we ultimately decided that this should be in the core. So this is something that we'll support in the core. Um, but we want to design it in a way that it's not inflexible. So if you don't want to, if you don't want to use this, um, we also designed, uh, this is actually our kind of like our working prototype for the first fully pluggable UI slot in the new MFE. So if you want to design your own thing, you can just swap it out, use something else. Or if you want to put something else there entirely, you can do that. So it's kind of the mix and match approach that we're, that we're building toward. Anybody recognize this feature? So this is another brand new feature. Um, this is just released in Aspects, or in our, in our Redwood. This is Aspects. This is our new data and analytics system. So Aspects is meant to replace Insights. Um, this is a brand new data and analytics reporting system. It's built on a whole different data pipeline. We're using XAPI events. Um, the Aspects experience includes dozens and dozens of reports for course level data, for cross, uh, we'll, we'll get to cross course level data, individual learner reports. Um, and kind of the same question, right? When we were doing some of the product design for this, one of the first questions we asked was, should Aspects be built in the core, or should it be built as a plugin, or do, you know, do we want this at all? And I think everyone in this room would agree that analytics are absolutely critical, <laughs> critical to delivering a, a good online learning experience. Um, but again, we wanted to design this in a way that would be flexible. And so we have, if I can just quickly go back here. Again, in the core, we've got a core set of reports that come, using my clicker here, a core set of reports that come out of the box. And again, this, is, this was driven by a lot of tons and tons of user data, um, interviewing lots of different users to understand which data is the most important, which reports do you want access to. Um, and so we've got a, set, a core set of out of the box reports that come kind of batteries included. Um, but because of the way it's designed on the back end, you can go in and choose any data points that you want and build your own reports for your own customized needs. And so again, kind of like blending, it's not quite pluggable, but um, kind of blending that idea of flexibility with how these features are designed. Um, if we want to explore kind of future state in this pluggable sphere space, um, if we think about where, where the data currently lives, we've got the instructor dashboard in the LMS, right? This is the place where instructors go to actually get these reports. Um, we could explore, <laughs> once that becomes an MFE, we could explore making that a pluggable space as well. So if you wanted to swap out the reports and dashboards that are currently there and build your own, we can make that an easy plug and play slot as well. So again, I'm just trying to like convey the framework and the kind of like the design thinking that we're using as we build these features. Uh, similar story for um, I know that the roles and permissions structure of Open edX is a long, a long, long time pain point for a lot of people in this room. Um, so we have roles, right? Course staff role, course author role. They are very, very difficult, very, very difficult to change. It's very difficult to create custom roles. Um, so we can take a similar approach in how we design this project, right? This project is early, it's in the discovery stages. But if we think about that framework, right, we can have a set of out-of-the-box roles that we know 80% of instances use, and we can have those roles be available in the kind of batteries operated included space. But if we design this well, right, we can get to a space where we've got the ability to create a role and you say, this, this role needs to be able to accomplish X, Y, and Z tasks. And I'm gonna take those tasks and I'm gonna attach them to that role, and I've got a custom role. So we talk about flexibility in that, that capacity as well. Uh, flexibility has a story on the content side too. 
Um, so this is one of the big topics that came up in the biz dev workshop earlier this week, right? The courses are too rigid, was I think the actual uh, feedback that we got. It's too rigid, um, it's too prescriptive. Uh, we need the ability for content to be flexible so it can be reused, so it can be shared, so that we don't have to like re rewrite the course every time we wanna reuse the content. And so content libraries is a project that we are heavily investing in now. This is actually a, this is the design for it. This is, uh, these are all public documents if you wanna take a look at the QR code there as well. Uh, flexibility here though is about being able to reuse the content easily. So you design the content in the library and then decide where it goes. Do you wanna use it in one course, in 12 courses, in 200 courses? Um, and again, kind of using that framework, this is a core part of the authoring experience, right? Being able to <laughs> reuse content. So we're building this as part of the core. Um, but I think in the future, there's some interesting accessibility questions we can ask here as well. Like what would it take to make libraries pluggable and what kind of Im impact could that have, right? In terms of integrating with third party content, with, with third party LTIs, that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, customized learning pathways. So this is another topic that I know has been uh, come up quite a bit in some of the biz dev projects that we worked on. Um, so this project, tagging, is we believe the first step toward getting to customized learning pathways. So with the tagging feature, which is also live in Redwood, course authors can add tags to any part of the course. Um, they can add a tag, you know, subject matter tag, skills tag, competency tag to a video, to a unit, to a whole section in a course. Um, and again, this was designed in a very flexible way. So this is also part of the core. We believe that flexible content is moving us toward more, you know, customized learning experience, personalized learning. This needs to be part of the core. But again, we have to design it in a way that allows for like optimized customization. So we are totally agnostic about which tags you use. You can in, you know, in, ingest any taxonomy or any set of tags that you'd like, and it's very flexible in that way. Um, there's also space like in the, uh, the pluggable sphere for um, supported API points if you wanted to have those tags feeding your third-party discovery systems. Um, we've got lots of flexibility there as well. Um, so that's, that's kind of the overview that I wanted to give, right? How is extensibility driving now how we're thinking about product development, how is it driving how we're thinking about product specs, and also encourage everyone else in this room as you're thinking about you know, new features for the platform or new things you'd like to see, ask yourself these questions, right? It, should it be part of the core and why? Is it best designed as a plugin and why? And that's gonna help us all as we start to think about this extensibility space more broadly. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Um, so three weeks ago, we launched Redwood, which is our, I don't know what number release, we're on the R's, eight, I think. <laughs> um, so Redwood is now live, um, and I wanted to just take a couple minutes to celebrate this because this was a, can I say this? A fucking huge endeavor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and everybody in this room deserves like a huge round of applause because this was an amazing, an amazing release. Um, I have some fun facts about the Redwood for you. Did you know that the redwood is the biggest tree on earth. Um, and I think that's an apt metaphor because, <laughs> uh, because redwood was a huge release. Um, we had the entire studio almost converted to micro front ends in redwood. We had major new features like aspects and like content tagging um, and contributions from across the community to make authoring more efficient, the new learner sidebar. This is a lot of stuff in a single release. So it's apt that we've named it redwood. Um, did you also know that Redwoods can support entire community ecosystems in their branches. They're so big that you will find like whole communities of mammals and birds and insects and moss and lichen within the branches of the Redwood. And that's also apt because we couldn't have gotten this release finished without everybody in the community. We had everybody involved um, from testing to writing tests to doing tests to coordinating tests to triaging tests to we had probably seven or eight different delivery teams on each of the different features. This was truly a community endeavor. And then finally, redwood trees are heroic. Um, again, they're so big that they capture, they literally take carbon out of the air and put it back in the roots, which is, uh, ecologists call them like heroes of climate change, because we can actually use redwoods to like <laughs> reverse some of the adverse effects of climate change. And similarly, we had so many heroes in the community helping us to get Redwood over the line. When we had last minute issues, we had people working 
on those issues up until the last minute. We had lots of people stepping in who had never been involved before. So with that, I just say congratulations to everybody in this room. We couldn't have done this without you. I did want to mention that I think we learned some important things from the size of the Redwood release. I think we'll probably uh, temper our ambitions a little bit in the future and try to do something that's a little bit more sustainable. Right? I think that's probably true. Um, but I wanted to share a small gesture of our thanks with the community. Um, and as Jenna said, it's really all of you that made the Redwood release possible. Um, and uh, what we have done at Axum is we've, we've bought a, um, a gift to the community. Um, uh, this organization in California is going to plant five redwoods uh, in honor of all of the work that you did. Make our small contribution to, uh, to climate change, I suppose, uh, based on what Jenna was telling you. So. Um, this was an idea I, you know, that um, actually somebody from Axum, Philip Schmidt had, I, I don't want to take credit for it, but it was such a wonderful idea that I think that this should probably be a tradition going forward. Um, I don't know if there's organizations that plant sumax, but we'll figure that out. Um, but uh, yeah, so again, thank you for all your work and um, they're gonna send us a picture of the redwoods when they're planted uh, around the turn of the year. Um, that's when they put them in, but I'll, and I'll share that. I'll share this and that on Slack at that time. Um, yeah, and then just, you know, you know, I think everybody in here knows this, but, you know, if you are already a member of working groups, then, you know, please encourage other people who aren't to join them. Um, you know, all the documentation about how to get involved on the product side is available at that QR code, so um, please um, stay involved and get help get other people involved. All right, so one of the most exciting parts for me of the, uh, the state of open edX is always sharing a story about someone who's really using the platform to make real important change in the world. Um, so I wanna welcome Elizabeth Gordon, uh, the assistant director at EdPlus at Arizona State to come up and talk to us about the work that they're doing. I also am very glad that there was a buffer between me and Professor. Um, I am not going to follow the trend of dropping any F-bombs because my boss is gonna watch this. <laughs> um, but let me, um, I wanna tell you just a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I am, as Ed said, I'm Assistant Director of International Instructional Design at Ed Plus, a division of Arizona State University. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about who we are and some of the things that we've learned in some of the work we've done in the global space. Um, ASU is one of the largest public research universities when you measure by student population in the United States. In 2023 alone, <clears throat> we enrolled 177,000 degree-seeking students. Um, we have, that's on campus, undergraduate, graduate, online, we have over 800 programs in all of those spaces. So um, if, if we, that includes 17,000 international students from 158 countries. So our global reach is vast, and that really informs a lot of the work that we do. We also um, obviously have ASU Online. Um, since 2010, when we launched ASU Online, we have had 100,000 graduates but this fall alone, we will have 100,000 students enrolled in ASU online classes. We have 350 different degree programs. We add new ones every single year. We have an entire team who's adding them and it's kind of exciting the kinds of things that they are doing. As an institution, um, I literally, I think contractually, cannot get up and speak for ASU if I don't show this slide. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but. A lot of institutions measure themselves and their success by their acceptance rates, which is by definition how many people you don't let in. That's not us. We're more about who we include, about how those students succeed, and by extension also because we're a public research institution, we're also about the public research. Um, we have an entire arm that that's what they do. 
But more fundamentally, we are about assuming responsibility for the communities we serve. And because we're a global organization, that kind of means the world. <laughs> and so this reach of the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities we serve has informed a lot of the things that we do that aren't degree-seeking students. And that's what I want to talk to you about a little bit today. Of course, my phone locked, and so I'm going to lose track of where I am. So um, guided by the ACCESS mission, um, I've been involved with a number of different projects that serve um, over the last seven years using Open edX and to advance some of the capacity building efforts. You've heard about some of this already. Uh, um, kind of a spoiler alert, Ishii is one of the things I'm talking about, but there's also a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, so to understand why this work is so important to us, I want to talk about statistics a little bit. <clears throat> so UNESCO did this study in 2015. Yes, it's a little outdated. They've done updates on the numbers. They hold true. So we just keep the slide because, again, I think I'm contractually obligated if I'm here on behalf of Ed Plus to do this shtick. <laughs> so um, in 2015, there were about 160 million learners who were degree-seeking students who needed degrees in order to find the jobs that, they, that the world needed done. When you project out to 2030, which um, I've been hearing this slide for forever, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 2030. That's six years from now. <laughs> but the number holds true. Again, uh, 410 million learners. In 2015, if we had said we're going to meet that demand, we would have had to start in 2015 building four universities, each serving 80,000 students. That's not a small university. If you've not looked at statistics recently, that's a pretty big size university. Four of them every week for 15 years. Spoiler alert, we didn't do that. It's not possible. You can't build that many brick and mortar universities. And so what you really see then is that the only answer is to go online, to scale, to do the kind of stuff that we do as a community. And so what we decided as an institution is that we would address this scale question by partnering for local, international, whatever that looks like. Partnering with organizations, other universities. It's a little antithetical for a lot of universities to empower other universities, but that's what we decided we were going to do. And to increase, um, basically, that access mission. Sorry, I lost track and I was... So I want to share with you just a few examples of some of the things that we've done kind of in partnerships around the world, but specifically here in Africa. Um, I think it's one of the important focuses. Um, Hatim made this, this, con this point yesterday with the statistics of the percentage of the world's youth that is going to be here in Africa. So it's really important of why we focus here. Obviously, following with the trend, the elephant in the room, the Ishii project, um, is a national level project. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I can um, I talk about some details of it in my later talk a little bit. But it is a national level project. We're partnering with the Ministry of Education to create online infrastructure and train both students and professors and IT staff across 50 public universities to move into that online space. We're also standing up the infrastructure with the LMS, Open edX, obviously, and a student information system within a completely custom portal. Um, the project is poised to impact about 800,000 learners and 35,000 instructors over the next five years will be fully launched and be at that level. From a regional pro project perspective, um, we had the um, Did I just go past? I did. I went too fast. Double clicked. I did that in my talk yesterday. I skipped three slides. Got to the end. I'm like, wait, what happened? All right, let's do this. Um, for Africa as a whole, we have a social professional 
um, learning community platform um, that really focuses on providing young people with access to lifelong learning um, through professional development courses, networking, mentorship, um, all kinds of resources to support transitions from school to work to career to retirement, all of that full package of lifelong learning um, platforms. Currently serves about 70,000 young people. We are growing at an exponential rate. It is open. It is completely no cost to all users. Um, we've got some generous foundations that are supporting that work. The resources are available in English and French to ensure kind of inclusive access for many of the populations um, across the continent. Um, we also have a platform very similar in focus um, to the previous one. This one was, is focused on the MENA region, um, has resources for lifelong learning. Um, there's also a gamified career planning tool on that that um, ASU has developed, really guiding young people through decisions about education, about their work planning opportunities. Um, this platform available in both English and Arabic, a lot of fun coding in Arabic. I could tell you stories. Um, it's lots of fun. Um, this platform reached 70, reaching 75,000 learners over 20 countries. Um, again, that idea of providing access to resources, to information, and expanding the reach of um, how many people have access to education. From a global aspect, there's another project um, ASU is doing removing barriers to just university access in general. Um, we created a program. One of the things we had um, done, we have um, quite a few scholarship um, projects with various corporate partners. We ran into this barrier where some of our corporate partner um, folks would come in, they'd try and apply. They couldn't get admitted to ASU because they had issues, perhaps, in their freshman year. A couple of bad grades, had too many fun, they were not eligible for admission. Not to us, not to any college, they wouldn't take them. We decided that wasn't really a fair prospect, and so we created this program. It's gone by like four different names. The idea, though, is that a student could come in, take that class that was the barrier. Statistically speaking, that was algebra for a lot of students, um, and so we were like, hey, come in, pay a small fee to uh, verify your identity, take the class, sign up. All you gotta do is give us your email. No long application process, just quick, easy sign up, Classes start routinely. Not that whole college semester thing, it's all over there. Come in, if you pass it, then you can decide to pay for ASU tuition. That tuition is transferable to anywhere that takes us our credit, which is a lot of people because we're kind of well known. Um, and then you can um, move on in that, if that was the barrier to you getting into college, it's fine. Take a couple of those classes, I think we now have about 30 classes in this program. Take those freshman level class, pass a set of them, you're automatically admitted to ASU. No questions asked, fill out the paperwork, you're in. All of that nonsense that you had your freshman year, all of that barrier, wiped away, gone, you continue on. Um, we have t globally, um, this basically lets people try out college education without any barriers, without any doubts. If you have to take algebra four times to pass it, it's, you're off the verification fee, not that big um, tuition fee. This allows them, learners, to enroll in university courses at low risk and learn that content. We've had 20,000 learners globally enroll in these courses just in 2023. We have admitted over 5,000 students to ASU as a direct result of this program. And it's only been, I think it's seven years since we got the full direct admission program actually put in place. That time's up, was that for me? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, how did we do this? Um, despite the differences between these projects, they're kind of all over the place in terms of the audience, um, who they're doing. The common thread is how we approach. It's a collaborative, integrated approach to addressing the challenges at hand. Um, so a couple of kind of common themes that, of how we approach these things. 
For optimal user experience, we always keep in mind mobile first. Doesn't always mean a mobile app. A lot of time that's mobily responsive websites, but it can be an app. We just released a new ASU app this year, another one of those kind of huge Redwood kind of projects. For many learners, a, a mobile phone is their only device. That's all they've got. Um, I think Professor mentioned earlier some of the times it's a shared phone. Um, so again, this, this idea of access, that not having a laptop not being a barrier. Um, we also combine multiple compatible technologies. This is one of our favorite features of Open edX, is that ability to connect uh, multiple things into one location. But here's the thing, just because we can, it's not just because we can, not just because we love ed tech, we do love ed tech, but the, comp the technologies we choose are things that serve the learner's needs, that really solve a problem for them, that get them to some goal that they need and solves a problem. We also, um, when we design our platforms, we ensure that they're flexible um, because we have ch uh, needs that change over time. One of our platforms is about eight years old and what it looks like now is nothing like what it looked like to you know, eight years ago. So we've completely redesigned it about three times. So that ability to take the technology, have it change over time, have it be flexible, is really important. We also, as much as possible, make them lightweight. Again, a lot of our users um, accessing the platforms on mobile, so you wanna make sure that you're not um, putting a lot of weight on their data usage. Again, the professor mentioned that, I think Tim mentioned that yesterday as well. And then, Focus on open source, and this has also been a driving um, feature for all of us. We are a government organization. A lot of our projects are grant funded, and so that ability to stay low cost by using open source software is a really critical feature for what we've done. Here's the thing. As ironic as this may this be to say at an ed tech conference, technology alone is not gonna get us there. It's not the end all be all. It's not the only answer. Um, this is, there's so much more that has to be done. What, many of the things that we've done in a lot of our projects are addressing to really achieve that true scale to meet the demand for access, you have to also address the people component. You have to build the capacity of the instructors, of the, in, of the students, of your, the staff, um, your technical staff. And so, um, for example, one of our other multinational projects that we have that is all we do. We train instructors on how to teach online. You know, that's, that was it. That's the main focus of the platform. We consulted with our IT staff a little bit, but it was more of the, how can we get you ready to go online just from understanding what be, being in an online space looks like. Um, <clears throat> in all of these platforms, we work um, with the community both to understand what the users need um, from a human-centered design standpoint so that we design our platforms to meet the needs of the users. We also work um, with the community to build community amongst themselves so that they can help each other. Um, learning online can be a solitary thing, but it doesn't have to be. If you work intentionally, you can create that community among the learners, and they will A, solve problems beyond what just we have the um, ability to address by working to, with each other, providing opportunities, um, making connections, creating that network, but also in um, just providing that social support for each other in um, solving problems and um, learning and making learning a more communal space. Um, for example, one of the other projects um, that we use uses a chat tool and we have a really robust, it's kind of like a Slack kind of a tool. It's an open source rocket chat um, tool that we use. Robust chat community, but they also decided, the community decided and brought to us, hey, we also want to host live events in communities. We found a group of people. Can you help us organize that? And so there are pop-up events that happen around Africa that bring our users together. We host Zoom meetings. I know it's not live, but it's liver than online. And so this idea of building community through all of the, play, the different ways of connecting folks. We have WhatsApp groups. So building that community to empower learning and um, change making. 
We also focused on removing barriers. I mentioned kind of our admission program, um, but there's um, scholarship programs. We have some, we also partner. Um, it's one of the places we, we do a lot of collaborations in pulling different organizations together, even just sharing opportunities. Our chat tools always have a scholarship board where people, they hear about a scholarship and they'll post it there for a friend to see who else um, can take advantage of that. We also have programs um, just to demystify the college application process. I don't know if any of you have applied or helped anyone apply to college recently. It's a lot. I just helped two kids go through this process. And one of the things that we have at ASU in Arizona is a program where we actually go into schools, starting in elementary school, and just start teaching first-generation families about the college application process. What does that look like? What do you have to think about? And yes, if you have kids, you know you have to start thinking about that in elementary school. Um, but it is a, a process, and so we've got this, this is one of the things that we address is that barrier to admission by providing information for um, our various populations. So in many ways, um, our experience shows that while technology is a crucial barrier, obviously um, we firmly believe in that, that's why we're here, that's why we're involved in the open ethics community in so many different technology spaces, but it's not the only thing. It takes a comprehensive approach in order to truly meet the educational challenges of our time, those 410 million learners, plus these scads of um, lifelong learners um, that are beyond that scope. So just a couple of things I want to share before I wrap up. Um, things that I've learned in my time helping ASU focus on these access missions. Um, first, innovative and exclusive, inclusive growth are important elements. Um, as we brought kind of the best practices that we've learned over previous projects, we also didn't start from the, well, because we did this over here on this project, we'll just do the exact same thing over here. Sometimes those best practices are what you need. It's the tool that you have and it works, why reinvent the wheel? But sometimes you have to start over. Sometimes you have to do something innovative. Sometimes you have to break the rules and do things different in order to meet the challenges at that time. So innovation and inclusion are uh, certainly important um, steps. So adapting your tools in your toolbox. And innovation lives right there in that perfect harmony between the practicality of proven tools and new ideas that are going to change the world. Second, global impact is possible when you collaborate. It's not something any one organization is going to do all by themselves to, to tackle the challenges. If you try to, as an organization, say, we have to do all of these things, it'll be overwhelming, and one of those things where it's like, there's no way we're ever going to do it. Together, through collaboration, through partnerships, these are problems that can, in fact, be challenged. It can be um, achieved. Obviously, we're all in business in some way, shape, or form. Somebody's got to pay the bills. And so there's this things like market share, branding, all of those business kind of um, things to address. But there's also that idea of solving those big, impossible problems by collaboration. And we believe that you, we can, in fact, address educational demands, foster lifelong learning by working with these collective efforts that transcend borders and barriers. And then finally, we believe we have an obligation um, to empower education. One learner getting a degree, getting a skill, getting that credential that helps them get that job, changes the world for that one learner, but it also can change their community and can be that catalyst where that ripple effect of change can go well beyond what you, that one person you might think could do. And we have an ability, we have seen kind of the impact of learning experiences for these diverse populations, students, professors, um, young African leaders. We've seen the transformative power of education. We have assumed that that transformative power is part of our mission that we can achieve um, through deliberately designing programs, not just to educate, but to empower individuals to change the world and their communities and make those transformations that make the impact of our efforts far beyond just those small scale of we graduated X number of students. So, in closing, um, 
we've already spent a lot of time uh, together chatting. I think the birds of the feather time, wine last night was great. But I want to challenge you in the time that we have left to um, kind of seek out other innovators, educators, ed tech leaders. Look for opportunities to collaborate, to share information partnerships, um, any even small ways of sharing information. Um, connect with somebody new, um, if you haven't already, <laughs> um, and really let's globally advance scaled access to education and create a brighter future for everyone. So. All right. Yeah, um, I think Find Elizabeth at lunch. She has to eat just like the rest of us, so you can talk to her while she's eating, and she can't, you know, be in, you can't she can't interrupt you right away. Um, but um, yeah, we are at lunch once again. So I stand between you and lunch, so I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, couple of last minute things. One, lost and found at the information desk. If you've lost something, go talk there. Tell them what you think what you've lost, and if we have it, we will give it to you. Uh, and I only mention this because I know at least one of you has lost at least one thing, because I have it. Um, so <laughs> it's a good thing. You want it back. Uh, and so check your stuff. Make sure you've got everything you think you've got. And um, if not, go to the information desk. Uh, and the other thing is uh, just another push for the community town hall tomorrow. If you are here, you are a part of the community. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your complaints. We want to hear what's working. We want to hear how we want to change things. Um, the discussion last year was amazing and vibrant and led to some amazing improvements in our community and growth. Uh, and I really want to see you all there tomorrow afternoon for that. I know the weather's going to be nicer. It's going to be Friday. You're going to be in Stellenbosch. But please, we want to hear from you. So thank you.